I'm Robert Griffin, the Executive Minister here at the Sunshine Cathedral in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I want to thank you for joining us for worship via the internet today. And if you are ever in the Fort Lauderdale area, let me personally invite you to stop by and worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 and 1030 a.m. We also invite you to join us on our Facebook group or follow us on Twitter. But for this moment, let's go inside and see what exciting worship opportunity lay in store for us. Please join me in our opening litany. You, God, are supreme and holy. You create our world and give us life. You have always been with us. You are infinitely generous and good beyond all measure. You are with us now. You empower us to be your gospel in the world. You overcome death. You are God, we worship you. Amen. The reading this morning is from the wisdom of John Adams. You will ever remember that all the end of study is to make you a good person and a useful citizen. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Our second reading is from the wisdom of Richard Bach. The questions are diamonds you hold in the light. Study a lifetime and you'll see different colors from the same jewels. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Our third reading is from the Gospel according to Luke. Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work myself? Tell her then to keep me, to help me. But Jesus answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. In these human words, God's voice is heard. In the 13th century, there was a Sufi mystic and poet called Rumi. And he once said, yesterday I was clever, and so I wanted to change the world. Today I am wise so I am changing myself. What Rumi is telling us is that spirituality should transform us. That our worship, our religious practices, our religious lives should be transformational. They should be transformative. We should not be in exactly the same place we are today that we were a year ago or five years ago or ten years ago. We should always be learning and growing and experiencing the mystery we call God in deeper and deeper ways. Sometimes we think that religion is meant to comfort us when we're sad or afraid, and it is. And sometimes we think religion is meant to challenge us, to, to, to make us want to, uh, to do better, to, to do more, to, to rethink something. It's meant to challenge us, to shake us up. And it is. And sometimes we think that religion is meant to bring us together, to form a loving community so that we can have baptisms and weddings and funerals and worship services and picnics, so that we can come together and so that we never have to celebrate our joys or face our difficulties alone. And it is. But what we sometimes forget is that religion's primary mission is to help us transform our lives into all they are meant to be. We are to transform our thinking. We are to transform the way we see the world. We are to transform the way we see ourselves. We are to always be growing more and more deeply in relationship with that which cannot be defined, that which can be loved but not really known, that which can be experienced but not adequately defined. And that 
is a lifetime's work. Transformation doesn't happen in a magic moment. I used to think it did. I used to think that when the bishop touched your head at the day of confirmation, something magical happened and you'd never be, you'd never be the, the same. Well, something may have started that day, but that wasn't the whole story. And, and I've been places where they, they had similar experiences where you could receive this spiritual baptism and you would be filled with gifts and energy and you'd never be the same. But that was the beginning of transformation, not, not the end of it. Or some people would have some sort of conversion experience or some aha moment. Or they would begin a 12-step program. And these beginnings are powerful and life-changing. But that's just the beginning. That begins the journey of transformation. And the journey is ongoing. Transformation doesn't happen in a magic moment. But the journey to begin transformation starts in a moment of decision. Paul, the Apostle Paul, wrote... To his community in Rome, actually uh, the only religious community that he wrote to that he didn't uh, start, he wrote to that community, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed by constantly renewing your consciousness, your thoughts. And that means studying, that means praying, that means changing your mind, that means becoming more and more aware of possibilities. It is a process. Be transformed by the ongoing process of renewal. And he wrote in his second letter to the group uh, that he was in relationship with in, in Corinth, he said, we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Spirit. Transformation is an ongoing process and it happens as we develop disciplines that help form and reform us into our best possible selves. That's why we are here. We're not here just to hear good music, though we have good music. And we're here not just to spend quality time with wonderful people, though we have good times with wonderful people. And we're here not just to have familiar rituals, though we have some and some new ones as well. But we are here, all of that is in service of the process of transformation. If we aren't different over time, that doesn't mean becoming someone we're not, but if we aren't growing, if we aren't changing, if we aren't maturing, if we are not expanding our thoughts and our consciousness, if we are not broadening our outreach, if our world is not bigger, if our experience of ourselves is not larger, then we aren't doing religion correctly, and it's not doing us much good. Transformation is what we are called to, and all of this, this is meant to be tools to help us on the path to transformation. We hear today's gospel reading every few years, and we think we know what it is. We hear it, we've heard it so many times, and we hear it sort of as a praise for Mary because she's pious. Mary, she, she sits at Jesus' feet. What a pious position. And then we, we hear Martha sort of being challenged, sort of, sort of a finger wag at Martha, because she's just a busybody, and she complains. Uh, you, first of all, did you hear in the, in the scripture, Martha invited Jesus into her home? Martha wrote the invitation. Martha said, come over for dinner, and then said, why isn't someone else doing what I said I wanted to happen? She's fussing at Mary for not helping her do what she said she wanted to do. And so we see that. So we use, that's usually the, 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 the take we, we take on this. Mary is pious, and Martha is just a whiner. Good Mary, horrible Martha. But that's not really a completely fair reading of the text. And I think to tell the story appropriately, I need a Mary and a Martha. So do I have a Mary and a Martha in the choir? They're coming down. Mary and Martha. So sit down, Walt. I don't need you this time. The, um, I got a Mary and a Martha. And uh, Twyla, why don't you be Martha? <laughs> why don't you be Martha? And so Mary sits, Mary sits piously and, and demurely, and Martha stands over in judgment and busyness. Okay, so, so now we have Mary and Martha, right? Okay. 
Mary and Martha are actually both parts of a big picture. Mary represents study and prayer. Martha represents work and sharing. Isn't that nice? So, and it's true. Like, people, like, if you're not going to be in communion, if you're not going to be in prayer, if you're not going to take those moments to really reflect and contemplate and experience the depth of silence in which God dwells, of course, God also dwells in our praises, if you're not going to spend that time in prayer and study and contemplation, then your work isn't going to be as fulfilling. But also, if you spend all your time on the prayer cushion, not much work work is going to get done. We need it all. We need the study and prayer, and we need the work and sharing. Mary and Martha together form a big picture. Mary, in the chair, Mary is spending time with Jesus. She's listening to his teachings. She's contemplating the spiritual lessons. She's feeling joy and gratitude. And Jesus says she has the better part. But he doesn't say that Martha is wrong. She, he says that Mary has the better part, and Mary's not going to lose what she is experiencing. Now, Martha could lose. In fact, Martha's already losing it. She's doing a good thing, too, but she's already mad. I'm doing it all by myself. Not enough people help. Not enough people care. I'm, my, my back is just almost broken in half because I'm carrying all the weight on my own shoulders. <laughs> she's already losing it. Mary's not going to lose her, 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 the investment she's put in prayer, but, but Martha's already losing the joy of service. So Mary's not going to lose that. So Jesus says Mary has the better part, but not that Martha is wrong. Martha actually has the right idea. Martha wants to do good work. She wants to be generous. It's Martha who says, come eat at my house, Jesus. Let me serve you. Let me cook for you. Let me share my food with you, my time, my home, my hospitality. Who could take issue with Martha's work ethic or her generosity? Martha's problem is that her work isn't centered in prayer. Of course, work itself can be a prayer if we dedicate it as such. But too often we just get busy and forget that our effort is in service to a larger, nobler goal. We get to scheming. We get to plotting. We get to complaining. We get to trying to take shortcuts. The work isn't joyous for us. It is exhausting. We find ourselves burning out. We find ourselves not always doing it uh, with the most integrity even because we didn't center it in prayer. We didn't dedicate it in prayer. We didn't fuel up first with prayer. We forget that we are offering our efforts as service to God by serving God's people, that our work is worship and not just a list of tasks. Martha's desire to be helpful and generous is wonderful, and it will be more effective if she makes it part of how she worships rather than a chore that she resents doing. Mary has the better part because she's fueling up with study and prayer that will then allow her work and her sharing to be a form of worship. And that's going to be transformative for her. Mary isn't getting off the hook. Mary's got stuff to do, but she's taking the time to fuel up first so that what she does is a continuation of praise and worship and ministry. Martha is doing what Mary will be doing, but she forgets to start out by doing what Mary is doing. Pray, study, work, share. Pray, study, work, share. That's the formula for transformation. We don't see either of them doing it all, but when we look at both of their lives, we do see it all, and we learn from both of them. We learn that we need to study and pray, and we also have work to do and sharing that must be done. And how we don't burn out with the work or get resentful with the sharing is that it becomes part of how we pray. Pray, study, work, share. That's how we are transformed. Mary has the better part, but not the only good part. Mary's part is what will make Martha's part more successful. 
pray, study, work, share. If you want to transform the world, start by transforming yourself. We can't erase racism or xenophobia or misogyny or heterosexism or poverty from the world, but we can transform our own consciousness, and that can help us do more that will make a difference over time. If spirituality isn't transforming us, if it isn't helping us be better, if it isn't helping us have more joy and hope, then we need a tune-up. Pray, study, work, share. That's how we give ourselves a tune-up. If we are religious people, if we identify as people of faith, but we live always afraid of the other, we need a tune-up. If we uh, call ourselves people of faith, but we resent being called into service, we need a tune-up. If we call ourselves people of faith, but we are not generous, we need a tune-up. If we call ourselves people of faith, and we uh, completely discount and discard other people of faith without even knowing what's in their hearts, we need a tune-up. If we call ourselves people of faith, and we, with our votes and with our speech and with our money, enact horrible prejudices, we need a tune-up. If we call ourselves people of faith and we do not know that genuine love is always divine, we need a tune-up. Spirituality should always be helping us tune up so that we are always being transformed into what we can be, to what we are meant to be. We'll never get it all right all at once, but we can always be a little bit better than we were a few minutes ago. When we work and pray and study more, we will get less exhausted from our work and will be more generous with our giving of time, talent, and treasure. We will keep our optimism fueled and we won't give in to disappointment as frequently. We need you, Martha. We need you, Martha. But to make sure that you don't burn out or get bitter, we need you to do what Mary is doing. We need you, Mary. We need you, Martha. We need you both to show us that we all, must always be praying and studying and working and sharing to be all that we are meant to be. And then as we are more of what we are meant to be, we can help the world be more of what it is meant to be. We need you constantly learning. And from that spiritually centered place of learning and prayer, we need you to share time, talent, and treasure. Your effort will make more of a difference when you understand it as being central to your spiritual life. I want us to be a transformational church. Yes, doing our part to improve the world, but realizing that that means to be constantly renewing and improving ourselves. And as we become more of what we are meant to be, we have more of our divine nature to share. We need study and prayer as Mary shows. When we work and share like Martha then, our deeds will make a bigger difference. When we come to worship, we aren't just coming to hear good music or comforting words. We are doing that, but we are also allowing personal transformation to take place. We are being called to action and equipped for action and reminded of our sacred value. When we are called to volunteer, to vote, to spend intentionally and wisely, and to be generous with our offerings, we aren't just being asked to stay busy. We are being asked to make our lives a prayer, the sort of prayer that will enable us to be the healing presence of Christ in the world. Mary and Martha... They aren't opposites. They together are the full picture. Pray, study, work, share. I bet you know it by now. Say it with me. Pray, study, work, share. That is the formula that can transform our lives. And transformed lives is what will transform the world. And this is the good news. Amen. Thank you.
Thank you for joining us today here at the Sunshine Cathedral. If you're ever in the Fort Lauderdale area, we invite you to stop by and worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 and 10.30 a.m. If you'd like to make a donation to the Sunshine Cathedral, or if you'd like to find out other resources that the cathedral has to offer, please visit us at www.sunshinecathedral.org. Until the next time, we look forward to seeing you here at the Sunshine Cathedral.